Um, again, my name is Terrell Dew Johnson, and I am Thana Atham from the Thana Atham Nation. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so I um, not only am a basket weaver, but I am a person from um, my community that growing up um, was always taught to help your family and help your community. And so that um, was instilled in my upbringing by my grandparents, Catherine and Alex Poncho, that are shown here. And I usually love to acknowledge them first because they were the ones that actually put me on my path um, to do the work that I do today for my community and my family. And um, I was very fortunate that I had my grandparents in my life. Um, my, grand my mother and my father um, were also very instrumental in my upbringing but they worked a lot. And so they worked a lot and having about five kids in the family, um, my grandparents stepped in and helped uh, take care of us and raised us. And that being that we would go with them out in the desert, harvest food. We would go with them and help them um, organize community activities and um, visit friends. So I was very fortunate to have that time with my grandparents. So um, I like to start my presentations off with them um, and acknowledge them. My grandfather and grandmother were farmers. They uh, came from the village of Calic, which was a traditional farming village. And they uh, would uh, grow their own food that would um, feed them for the year. Uh, where I'm from, we're very fortunate that we have winter crops and we have summer crops. And so um, we rely on um, the rainwater to supply the water for these fields. This type of method of farming is called flood-based farming, where we actually rely on the rainwater from the monsoon seasons to water our, our, our crops. And so with the... Um, with a, a planning of diverting the water from these huge washes to runoff, we built these dikes to actually, or these canals that actually go into our fields and um, just dump the water into these fields. And that water would just cover the fields completely, which is called um, blood, uh, flood base farming. And um, that's how we got water for our crops. And so this picture actually was taken in the 40s and 50s of my grandfather working in the fields, and I think right now he's harvesting beans. This is a picture of my grandmother, who also was in the garden and worked every day in the garden to tend to the garden. Um, you know, my mom used to always tell us stories that they used their job was to run around and chase all the animals out of the garden, rabbits, uh, squirrels, things like that. Um, this is a picture of my grandmother in, um, I think, which is probably wheat or corn field there and so I was very fortunate that I actually found these pictures and there's pictures of my grandparents and family in their fields. This is a picture of my mother and her sisters. My, my grandmother had 12 kids and uh, two of them were sets of twins and um, these were um, my um, mother's siblings who would help on the farm. Um, and this was a daily thing that they did because this is what was going to feed them for the year. So the families that were from Colic, this farming village, all had fields where everybody participated in harvesting, planting, taking care of the fields. And my, my, my mother and her siblings were also part of that as well. So this is a picture of my mother and her sisters getting ready to thrash the bean harvest. So what they'll do is with a stick that she has, they will beat the beans and will loosen up the beans from the pods. These are my great-great-grandparents. Um, and they, um, only, the only source of water out there were these wells. And they were placed in certain areas of the village. And so they would go, it was some more of a communal well, and they would go and harvest the water or get the water there and haul it to their house. Sometimes when there wasn't enough rain for the fields, they actually would hand water their crops using this type of method. Um, from the village, from a farming village, everything was communal. And so 
uh, families would help other families when it was time to harvest. We'll go from field to field and help families harvest their crops. And so this is actually a picture of uh, the men thrashing um, the wheat that was harvested from someone's field. The reason why I show those pictures is because right now in Native communities, um, because of not growing your own food and utilizing a lot of these traditional foods in your area, um, disease has come upon com Native communities. And one of the main diseases that um, happened uh, from the lack of, of, of knowing and using these traditional foods is diabetes and cancer. So unfortunately, my grandfather um, had succumbed to diabetes. He died from complications of diabetes. My grandfather was a healer, a traditional healer. He also was a counselor for alcoholism, and he also did many other things. Um, but um, at the end, you know, it was diabetes that took his life. And I put this picture in here. I'm also a photographer as well. But um, I took this picture in here because we would t take turns taking my grandmother to visit my grandfather's grave. And she would sit and visit and tell, tell him, you know, how her day went or how her week went. And on this particular day, she allowed me to take pictures of her. And I captured the image of her talking to my grandfather. And um, years later, my grandfather, my grandmother also had passed away from complications of diabetes as well. But this was an issue that a lot of people were not really talking about the time that I decided to organize this, um, this uh, organization that I worked for. And uh, at the time, they were programs to help community members uh, combat um, diabetes, but it was done in a way that um, the tribe would have these programs that were designed from someone who wasn't really too familiar with how Native communities work. And it was really um, different from, say, someone from the city compared to someone from the uh, reservation. You know, a lot of these programs were saying, eat more broccoli, eat more cauliflower, and exercise, go to the gym and exercise. Well, when you're uh, from the Sonoran Desert, it's hard to find and grow broccoli and cauliflower, and we didn't have any gyms anywhere. So it was a little bit disconnecting um, these programs when they were supposed to be implemented in Native community. So uh, I was uh, forced to look at the idea of how can we make this a little bit more easier and more community friendly. Um, understanding that when I was growing up with my grandparents, I was taught how to recognize the different kinds of foods that were in the desert, like wild spinach, um, prickly pears, choya buds, mesquite beans, and this was all foods from the desert that Creator had provided for us. And so um, I didn't see a lot of people eating those kind of foods. And so um, with the help of my grandparents who were still alive at the time, um, they were valuable resources and instructors to use um, to actually start teaching the uh, method of going out and foraging uh, traditional foods. And so, um, this is how the program that I work for currently um, started. And so we actually started providing gathering trips, classes on how to recognize traditional foods, how to pro process traditional foods, and how to cook traditional foods. And from just that simple idea and organizing these um, um, classes, the organization that I work for, Donna Altam Community Action, started. And so it was utilizing the resources in my community by having elders come and teach and pass on this knowledge of traditional foods and watching it grow over the years. So um, the fields that my grandparents had worked on um, lay dormant for several years because after they um, were more modernized and moved out of the village and moved into a more bigger um, village and lived in um, um, a modern house and went to the supermarket to go shop, 
they really didn't find it necessary to start uh, to continue farming. So maybe 20, 30 years, um, the fields that my grandmother and grandfather worked on lay dormant. Um, since we started this organization that I work for, um, we decided to um, revitalize the farmland. And so with the help of funding and um, community efforts, we actually went back to the family farms and started working the fields. And so this is a picture of us working in the fields, revitalizing that um, area. Uh, this is a more wider uh, picture of, of our fields there, and we're actually getting ready to, to till the soil and take the weeds out so we can start planting um, our new crops. One of the um, staple foods in our diet is beans. Now these beans, these are called temporary beans, and these are a bean that is a drought resistant, that um, with the intense heat of the summer and the lack of water thrives in the desert. And so these beans are called tepary beans. Um, I'll talk a little bit more later, but um, you know we, we currently have a cafe where we put and highlight a lot of these native foods from the Sonoran Desert on our menu. Um, one of the other things that we grow is corn, 60-day corn. 60-day corn is an amazing corn that from seed to um, um, its uh, planting cycle to when it's time to harvest can all happen within 60 days. Now the reason why this happens is because there's really not that much water on in the desert. And so during the time of monsoon season, it's a good maybe month and a month and a half of rain that we get from the rains. And so um, planting this corn within that 60 day, this is its only source of, of water. And so within 60 days, from seed to, to maturity, this happens with the 60-day corn. And with that, you know, we um, can do many things when we harvest that corn. We can parch it, we can grind it, we can make gruel, we can make soups, we can even roast it and eat it fresh off the cob like that. Um, I'm gonna show this little video. Um, with the program that we have, we work a lot with young people. And during the summer and during the course of the year, we have these um, programs where we hire and work with youth to um, um, you know, um, keep this tradition of farming alive. And so one of the things that we require with the, participa the participation of young people is they learn how to tell their stories. So this particular story was done by one of our interns who later became a more permanent staff, Samantha Felix, and she's gonna talk about her experience of, of going through our programs. My name is Samantha Felix, and I work for Donaldson Community Action. I am the manager for Project Oibuk, which is a youth-based program. Hello, my name is Terrell Dew Johnson, and I am the CEO of Donna Autumn Community Action. TOCA is a nonprofit grassroots organization that was started about 18 years ago here in cells on the Donna Autumn Nation. And we really were focusing on revitalization of the culture through the arts, the food, and the language. We host the choy bud harvest. Usually after the jordan harvest comes after that is the bilich harvest, which is the sorrel fruit. We come together as a community or just people and go out and harvest the sorrel fruits to make syrup and jam out of it. Then after that um, comes our big one of our big events, which is um, the Harvest Festival. When we come to the Toka Farm, which is located in one of the villages called Calic, we do traditional games. We invite vendors out, and we give away food. All the events and all the different stuff that we do throughout the year is important because it helps keep our traditions alive with the traditional foods and the games and just knowing 
when to go out and harvest the, the wild foods helps the people in the village and just in general know that it's still there and not to forget it. Our goal is to get our community healthy, to make sure that everybody in on the nation has access to this um, traditional foods, not only traditional foods, but healthy foods in general. But our whole goal is to get foods and all the, all the traditional foods into every household and lunch um, program out here on the reservation. Working with Toka really changed my the way I look at our culture because when I first started, I didn't know anything about Toka or even know much about our culture and the foods and the games and the ceremonies that we put on. After working with them for some time, it really um, changed the way that I look at things and just made a difference in my life. It like really changed the way that I look at culture because I don't look at it as just being there. I look at it as it's important that we learn about our, our foods and our traditions like the games and storytelling and some of the ceremonies because it's up to our generation to carry it on to teach younger kids and youth so that they will know and our culture won't die. So that's a little uh, video that, again, uh, Samantha had done for her project to explain to the community of her experience working in our program. So um, all that food that we've been um, teaching the community about, um, the wild foods, but also the cultivated foods, uh, we uh, came up with the idea of, well, we got to have all this food ready for, for someone who's busy and can't. Um, can't um, cook for themselves or is, is, is just um, not really knowledgeable about um, the foods. And so we figured, well, let's put a cafe together and let's serve these foods from the cafe. And so the idea of opening a cafe called Desert Ring Cafe happened. And so this is um, just a picture of our cafe and some of the foods that we have that we highlight and specifically make sure that every dish on our menu has some sort of aspect of a traditional food from the desert. And so one of our favorite, one of my favorite personal dishes is the prickly pear glazed ribs. Um, you see a bowl of beans that was grown from our farm, some of the greens that we actually harvest from the desert along with a prickly pear vinaigrette and a prickly pear glazed on um, some meat. And so this is one of our top sellers and one of my personal favorites. As part of the cafe opening, we uh, utilized all aspects of the cafe. Our chef would um, have um, schools come and visit and have them experience um, what happens in the back of the house in the kitchen where he cooks and does all his cooking for the cafe. And so he opens his kitchen up to uh, visitors like uh, this particular picture here of a class that came to visit and see how a... Um, a genuine um, cafe restaurant is run. Um, we also work a lot with uh, individual uh, community members who are thinking of having a, um, um, a job in the culinary field. And so we actually have interns that come in and work with us for a week or so or a month to learn the, um, the ins and outs of running a restaurant. And it's really important, especially for Native American uh, people in our community, to have these different experiences because on the reservation, there's not really many opportunities for a chef. And so when we give them this kind of training and understanding that this is possible, they choose to maybe continue working in the culinary field so that they can go off and maybe start their own restaurant or work in a restaurant 
not understanding that they got these hands-on skills um, through our organization. Um, one of the other programs that we have in our cafe is this guest chef um, program where we invite and work with chefs from all over the country to come to our community and to actually cook a dinner using our um, foods from the desert. It's sort of like an Iron Chef competition kind of thing. So we give them a bag of beans, a bag of choya buds, um, meats from the desert, and we tell them, go cook an amazing meal. And it helps in several different ways. First of all, we do make, use it as a fundraiser. So we work with a lot of well-known chefs around the country to uh, come to our area and prepare these foods for our community. We sell tickets and we have people from all over the state of Arizona or the Southwest that come and participate in this night of, of amazing foods that these chefs prepared for, for us. <clears throat> in fact, to the point where we actually have chefs on a waiting list waiting to come out and, and, and cook for us. So this is a program that we have and it's really uh, been very well received in our community and surrounding communities. Um, again, we also do a lot of community service in it with um, the organization that we have and the cafe that we have. We sponsor um, free meals for elderly, for community members. Unfortunately, we do a lot of um, donations to uh, community funerals and passings of people like that. So it's really important to keep up those kind of programs for the community. One of the other things that we do, um, because we highlight a lot and promote a lot of cultural revitalization through the foods, is we put on a lot of these food festivals, highlighting traditional foods from the Southwest. We also work with a lot of organizations and people around the country where um, they're trying to do similar things in their own areas. And so we work a lot with um, planning these food gatherings for natives. So we work with a lot of native food producers. We look, work with a lot of native chefs um, and organizations that promote this kind of uh, programming. And so these are really fun for me, especially because I get to eat a lot of food from different areas. But the thing is that, you know, when we work with um, people that have the same goal in their own communities to preserve and um, revitalize their food system, it's really exciting, especially when you're working with young people and elders, because it's the elders that actually pass on this tradition and information to the young people who are going to utilize this in um, years to come. Is there also a really great way to network with other communities around the country? because where I'm from, for many years, I thought we were the only ones that were doing this. So we actually were more or less, re, um, we were building a template for a lot of other organizations around the country to follow. Now it's a little bit different because what works in our area may not work in other areas, but when you take things that you need and ideas that you need to build upon your own program in your area, amazing things happen. And so over the years, starting this, doing this kind of work for about 30 years, it was really nice to see what we started and began to do 30 years ago and, and how it's kept on and how it's um, evolved to the present day. Now, first of all, it makes me feel very old, but you know, it's just amazing to see how far um, um, cultural revitalization through the foods has come. You know, this um, food sovereignty movement has impacted several organizations and several communities around the country. In fact, today we're here at the Smithsonian uh, NMAI because they're having this food summit. So it's really amazing to see how far um, this idea has come. At our food gatherings, we do a lot of a programming um, showing what kind of methods of, of traditional foods you can use, how to preserve your foods, how to prepare your foods. And so this picture is um, of a young woman, Amy Wan, who is showing people how to preserve um, squash. So what she does is she skins it and then she cuts it in a spiral and makes a rope out of it. And then with that rope, she ties it up and stores it. 
Um, in fact, I have a table outside in the tundra, so you can come to my table. And I do have a couple of um, rope squash that um, I have on display. Um, again, one of the favorite things that I like at these gatherings is you get to eat the food. So this is a picture of some of our, partic our participants eating the food that was cooked for the day that were prepared by a lot of the native chefs that come to our gatherings. And there's a lot of talks and presentations, again, on a lot of <clears throat> the different programs that, um, that are around um, in different communities around the, the country. This is just a nice glamour shot of, of baskets, but also be, of the beans that we use in our cafe and that we grow from our fields. This is an elder, um, the late Francis Manuel, who was very instrumental in helping us um, preserve a lot of the recipes and the stories about traditional foods, but also has been an advocate for the language and who, um, also was very instrumental in helping us write a cookbook that we published years ago called From Ethoy's Garden. We utilized um, and, and, and used a lot of um, Frances to promote our program. In fact, she did a lot of visiting of schools to talk about how she was growing up in the desert utilizing and eating a lot of these traditional foods. This is the picture of some of our products that we actually started marketing from our fields and a lot of the food that we produce, um, we sell um, to the public. And so this is a picture of some of our, our bean products that we, we, we sell. Again, working with schools was one of the most important projects that we've done with this um, organization. And one of my favorites as well. Giving the uh, young people an opportunity to see how food is grown. A lot of times, a lot of these kids don't know that food, uh, food comes from the ground. So working with schools as young as kindergarten age and helping them start school gardens is really important for us. And having and teaching young people the traditional way of growing foods from the start of blessing the ground that you're going to work with, blessing the seeds that you're going to be planting, blessing and singing during the time of growth of your, of your crops, and then harvesting and singing um, when you're ready to harvest these foods. And so these are the things that we teach young people. And it covers a lot of, of, of points when we do that. First of all, again, we are passing on the cultural information to the young people. We're also helping them understand and utilize the language that is so important to our people. But then also just really having them grow and um, utilize and eat healthy food. This is a picture of one of our tastings that we have with the kids. And it's really fun to have um, these tastings in the schools because I truly believe that right now with the kids and the food that they're serving um, in lunchrooms, it's really processed um, high fat food that doesn't really have any kind of nutritional value to it. Um, so I always tell that a lot of the kids that eat these foods, their taste buds are numb. But when they have these um, tastings of these flavorful foods, um, you have kids come up to you saying, oh, it tingles right here in my face. You know, and I said, well, that's your taste buds waking up and being stimulated by these flavorful foods that you're eating. And so this is always a fun time for me when I see y'all, a lot of young people experience that first time of tasting these foods. Another thing that we also promote and, and, and do is a revitalizing the, the games that were done traditionally. This is actually a traditional game, th a game called Thaka that um, young women, um, or women in general, um, play. So it's kind of like ice hockey, but it's done by women and it's done on the dirt. And all they do is they get these sticks and they hit across um, to one end to the another. And so it's only um, done by women. And so this is a picture of the women playing thaka. And when we first started teaching this to the young women, there wasn't many, a lot of people interested in doing this kind of game. But now there's several, there's over, I'll say, 100 um, teams on the reservation that play this game. Um, a lot of them um, actually have um, teams 
and they actually started doing tournaments um, there on the reservation of these games. Again, working with the young kids. It's the young kids that are going to be benefiting um, from years to come, learning this knowledge, these methods, these stories, these traditions. Um, you saw earlier uh, pictures of Samantha's story about how we go out and we also really promote um, harvesting the desert. Um, one of the um, most important uh, food that we harvest is the fruit from the saguaro cactus. And with this, um, when we harvest this, and we're actually coming up to the season during the summer is we harvest this and we make um, syrup and jam, but we also make wine that is used in our most important ceremony in the desert, the rain ceremony. So when we harvest this fruit, we, um, ferment, it, we ferment it into wine, and for four days and four nights in the desert, we sing and we dance, praying for rain, because rain is what's gonna keep us alive for the year. So with that rain that comes during the monsoon season, we, um, it waters the earth, it replenishes the earth and it waters the crops. And with that, with the crops, we get to eat, but then also the animals get to eat as well. And then we hunt the animal. So it's sort of uh, the, rev the revitalization of desert life. And so we refer to this as our new year. Again, this is one of um, the harvests that we have during the year. And this is the harvest of the choya buds. It's a bud of a cactus that we harvest and we eat. And so it, this is a picture of a grandmother and granddaughter actually going out and harvesting this plant. With our field, we, uh, we do a lot of traditional methods like the flood-based farming, but we also do a lot of the hands-on um, preparation of and the process of the food. So actually this is a picture of some of our farm workers actually stomping and thrashing um, the beans that they just harvested that day. You can also see the picture of the squash that they also pulled as well. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I am a basket weaver and I'm very fortunate that I've been able to combine the two together. So with um, with um, my knowledge of basket weaving, I also teach a lot of that in our organization. And it's really important to pass on these traditions. And so, as, as I mentioned, I'm also a contemporary basket weaver. So these are just pictures of some of the shows that I've done of my contemporary work. This is one of my latest pieces I did. Another piece of mine. Again, I'm also a teacher of the arts of basketry, and so this is actually a picture of one of my um, first students who, at the time this was taken, and when I had hair, uh, was um, Sissy Marie Wan, who um, at the time, this picture was taken when she was eight years old, um, and she is a basket weaver, but also is going to school to become a lawyer right now. It's really important, again, to really understand that it's the elders that are passing this information and this tradition onto the young people. Um, this is a picture of the late Danny Lopez, who is doing a ceremony, blessing, and singing to the plants. And this is um, also a picture of my niece, who is the daughter of my brother, who was our farm manager. And so he, during the time of the ceremony, you know, she went up and was very curious to see what he was doing. And it just was a really nice picture that I took. And this is, again, basically doing, showing and, um, and saying this how, is how it is, how important this is um, for us. Again, for us to understand that it's the elders that are passing this information on to the young people who will benefit in, the few, in years to come. And again, it's, it's for the next generation. So this is actually a, a school that came to visit our farm and we let them run around and harvest uh, the squash that at that time. And so we let them take the squash home. So these are a group of young kids who are showing off their harvest for the day. So thank you so much for listening to me and about my program. And we're gonna open it up to questions. So. By the way, this is um, streamed live.
So if you have any questions, we do have a mic in the center of the aisle there. So I appreciate it if you can ask your questions at the mic so that people on the internet world can hear you. Uh, thank you again. And I love questions. So if you have any questions, please ask. Is there any questions? Yes. I think so. Yes. Through your methods of sustainable farming, uh, how much have you been able to decrease the incidence of diabetes with, among your people? Um, well, um, we definitely have seen a, a decrease in um, the, um, we have, yes. Um, I'm sorry, I, I just lost my train of thought. That's um, we have, I mean, doing this kind of work for the past 30 years, working with kindergarten age um, in the very beginning, teaching them this um, methods and talking about the traditions of preserving um, the language, the songs, the art, and the food, them currently, seeing them as young adults currently, um, the knowledge that they learned back then, they're still utilizing. So it's really amazing to see how far we come the schools that we worked with on the reservation now make it mandatory to have this kind of um, um, workshops and training in the schools. In fact, the schools that we worked with years ago never had traditional foods on their menus, on their lunch programs. But now it's mandatory for all the schools that are on the reservation to have some sort of implement of traditional foods in their menus, which is amazing. Um, so we've seen that education passed on and and kids learning that. I always tell kids, I always tell people that, you know, back then when I was growing up, they had this campaign for cigarettes, you know, stop smoking or don't smoke when you get older. And so a lot of the young people would tell their parents about don't smoke because it can cause these illnesses like cancer. So using that sort of model about traditional foods we're having young people telling their parents when they go to the grocery store, let's get more healthier foods, let's try choya buds, let's go out in the desert and harvest these foods because um, the desert is a, is a supermarket, is a kitchen. So they can go out there and harvest it. So we've seen those sort of uh, ways of thinking of young people and using that and utilizing and teaching other people about that. So yeah. Um, with that, a lot of times, a lot of the kids really know that if they eat a lot of processed food, they know that it can have an effect on their body and their health. So we definitely have seen a lot of, um, of interesting progress with what we've been doing for the past 30 years. Is nutrition taught in the schools? Yes, it is. I think with a lot of the programs um, out there, and with not only native communities, but uh, in the whole community in the general, there are a lot of health issues um, hitting different um, ethnic groups. And so um, we, we have seen that the increase in nutrition education in the schools. Uh, what about the athletic uh, programs and is nutrition incorporated into those too? Um, where I'm from, yes, it is. Um, I know because of budget cuts and things like that, the arts and physical education are usually the ones are the first to go. But because when we come in and teach a whole kind of a way of thinking about coming from a cultural um, point, um, it's easy to talk about um, the traditional games, the physical activity games that we do do, like the picture that we're showing of the women playing um, um, thaka. So it is yes. being done in my area. Thank I don't know you. about anybody else's area. Hi, um, can you describe the method that you use for harvesting the fruit from the cactus and you know, avoid it, separating out the prickly parts and all that? Yeah, well, I think in, in Samantha's little video, you saw her 
um, hold a little bush brush that she brushed against the um, choya buds that took off the cactus. And with this uh, creosote brush, it's a little gummy. So when you're brushing off um, the, prick, uh, the stickers of the choya buds, it picks it up, but it also just brushes it off. And so that's one of the methods that we use to, to pick the, the choya buds because they're so prickly. But also, just because of people harvesting them, um, some people burn them off. Um, I wouldn't recommend that, but they do that. But then also you can pick a whole bunch of them and put them on a screen and sift them, and it will take the um, stickers off as well. So there's a couple of methods to do it, but um, the old-fashioned way is getting creosote and brushing them off. Any more questions? Yeah, one more. Yeah. Um, so question for you. Uh, a lot of today's agriculture is leaning more toward developing technology to increase yields, decrease waste, et cetera. Um, what values do you see in uh, preserving uh, more uh, ancient farming methods, if you will, or historical farming methods, as opposed to taking these same foods that you're currently growing and using more modern technologies to improve yields? Well, I mean, I've always said that, you know, if we had access to um, um, the modern tools that um, people use, like say my grandfather did, I think he would utilize them. Um, you know, but um, it's good to have a, um, a bit of pieces from both kinds of, of, of worlds, like the modern versus tradition. I think you always can borrow and utilize a lot of that knowledge to make it a lot easier. You know, I, you saw the picture of my great grandparents hauling water to their fields. Um, when I was growing up, um, when my grandfather was still using um, farming, he would get this huge metal um, water tank, fill it up at the well, and then we would go and truck it off to the fields where we would just drive along some of his fields and we would pour water out to water the field. So that was a way of how he used modern technology, but I think um, it's really important. It's really, I don't see any harm in using um, and borrowing ideas and methods. Um, I think anything to make it easier really does help. One of the things uh, that, um, you know, we always know that if, uh, elect if we don't have electricity, if we don't have modern tools, we can still use those old methods to keep growing these crops. So um, I don't think it hurts at all to, to incorporate um, technology into your, um, your, uh, our growing our crops. Um, one thing that we don't use is pesticides and things that will harm the environment, that will harm the land. So you gotta be cautious about those things. Okay, well, again, thank you so much, enjoy, and enjoy the rest of your day.